Hello, and it is great to see you this morning at the Heights. Uh, I'm glad that you're able to, to be here and, and you're comfortable with it. This is what I would like you to do, is to turn to the person next to you and say, welcome to church this morning. So right now, turn to the person next to you. If you're by yourself, just pretend that you're talking to yourself. But if there's someone else in the room, then turn to the person next to you and say, welcome to church. Now, I know that most people didn't do that because they felt really uncomfortable about it. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a second to go back there and think about it again. So ready? Here we go. After three, welcome to church. One, two, three. Welcome to church. It is very welcome. That you, and welcome to church to you and welcome to church to you. It is great that you're here. Great that we can join together. Excellent that we can praise our Lord. So let's start off with, yes, I will. Lift your name to the highest heavens. Amen. Let's do that together. I count on one thing the same God that never failed. Your name, 
Water you turn into wine Open the eyes of the blind There's no one like you None like you Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Our God is greater Our God is stronger God you are higher than any other Our God is healer Awesome in power, our God, our God. Yeah. Water you turn into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. None like you. Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Our God is greater Our God is stronger God, you are higher than any other Our God is healer Awesome and powerful stop us and if our God is with us then what could stand against and if our God is for us then who could ever stop us and if our God is with us then what could stand against what could stand greater our god is stronger god you are higher than any other our god is healer awesome in power our god our god our god is greater our god is stronger god you are higher than any other our god is healer awesome in power our god our god God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And who for us, what could stand against? What could stand against? What could stand against? What could stand against? Better than life is 
I will praise you as long as I'm alive in the face of precious Jesus oh my soul will be satisfied oh, 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 oh. seek you oh my soul it longs for you my flesh faints for you in this land this dry land where there is no dream I will look upon you in this place beholding your power Because your love is better than life is I will praise you as long as I'm alive In the face of precious Jesus Oh, my soul will be satisfied Precious Jesus, oh, my soul will be Hey, isn't that fantastic, us, uh, how we've been able to join together in praise and worship of our God? Look, I want to thank our team, and I'm sure that you do too. And if you'd like to get their, their email addresses and stuff, just email me and I'll, I'll send it out to you so you can thank them. But you know who they are, don't you? you? You know the people behind the decks, you know the people on the stage, you know the people who work behind the scenes so that they can bring this service to you. 
It is fantastic what they do. And every single week they give all themselves to that task. And, and I, I just want to praise them. I want to give, I want to give them uh, the thanks that they deserve. And I want to praise God for, for their servant heart and how you've worked in their spirit to bring all that they do here for us. That's great, isn't it? And as we come together as a church, as we join together, I pray that you've been able just to launch out with your lungs. Hey, we can't sing here. We can't even meet here. But you can sing your lungs out at home and you can praise God. And whether you raise your hands, whether you're on the floor, whether you're sitting there and you're just eating your rice bubbles uh, uh, quicker in the morning, whatever you're doing, isn't it fantastic? that we are able to join together as a church. We are one. We're joined together. And here's a, a very unusual passage, but uh, we don't often read that. Psalm 134 says, Praise the Lord, all you servants of the Lord. That's you. But then there's also, Praise the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who minister by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. And here's what we pray for our great team. May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who is the maker of heavens and earth. And I'm sure that you're with me in that, how great it is to be served each week and how great it is, is to sit together as a church. Let's pray in thankfulness to God. Lord, we thank you that you have been at work this week in our hearts. You have been at work this week in our lives. You have taught us, Lord, and we thank you for that. You have guided us, and we thank you for that. We have, we have listened to your voice for those who have gone to Bible study and, and joined in connect groups, and, and you have taught us more about yourself. We, through your spirit, you've enabled us and equipped us, and we give you thanks for that. How awesome it is to join as a church, as one, to be in ministry for you, and I pray, Lord, that you bless the ministry of the church. I pray, Lord, that you bless those who are going out and meeting on Zoom every day. How hard that is every day looking at a computer screen, every day being on the phone and talking to people. I pray that you bless them. I pray that we still have opportunities to show you through the words that we say, the way that we connect, the way that we communicate with other members of our work for other people in school, with the teachers who are teaching you. All those people, we give you praise, Lord, for them. And we pray, Lord, that we are a witness for you. And we pray, Lord, that all that we do in the way that we communicate, the character that we show, the way we get about doing the things that you have called us to do, I pray that your name is glorified in everything. And I pray this in your holy name. Amen. A lot of things happening at the Heights. Uh, one great thing that's coming up is State Youth Camp, and Chris is going to fill you in about that right now. Hey, Church, just a real quick youth update from me. On Friday, we had our last fuse for Term 3. We, of course, moved our whole program onto an online format. We've been using Zoom on there, and we've been having a whole heap of fun on Friday nights. It's been really awesome to see so many of our youth being uh, getting so involved, being so excited and enthused. Uh, to get amongst all the really cool nights that we've been having on there this term. We're really looking forward to what next term is going to be bringing for us in that Friday night space. This Friday and Saturday, we are attending the online Baptist State Youth Camp. We were going to be attending in person. We're now going to, as a youth uh, group, be attending in the online format that they're going to be putting on next Friday night and all day on Saturday. There's going to be some really crazy fun tribal wars. There's going to be some really great speakers and, and, and there's going to be some breakout time uh, for us as a youth to just hang out uh, and, and have some time together as well. The cost of the camp on the online camp if for us, for our youth is going to be free. Uh, thanks to the generosity uh, of you guys as us as a church. Um, um, but please do let me know if you're a youth, let me know if you're a parent of a youth, please let me know uh, if you are coming uh, because uh, I want to be able to put the right names down on who's coming, but also because uh, I want to be able to deliver contactlessly, of course, uh, some of these camp packs that got delivered to me this week. It's going to be a really great time next weekend. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. And, and, and I think it's going to be a great time for us as a youth to spend some time together, uh, maybe meet some other youth and, and, and have a whole heap of fun 
next weekend. Uh, during the school holidays, our Tuesday youth Bible study will be continuing on Tuesdays at 5 p.m. And our Friday night program will be returning uh, next term on October the 15th. Thanks so much, guys. And keep please uh, praying for our youth. Hey, thanks, Chris, for that. Uh, look, I'd love to be young again to get out to state youth camp. And even though they're, they're, they're doing it online this year, uh, it's a great time that pe where people can gather together and, and connect with a, a larger group of people. And I pray that the youth really get blessed in that. It's amazing, isn't it? This this term has absolutely flown by because uh, as we come up to this week, school holidays are starting. And so, you know, great, we're on school holidays. I don't know whether it's going to change our lives a heck of a lot, but uh, I know that it's fantastic for the teachers and and uh, and for, for uh, the youth to be able to just relax and not be on Zoom and connect in school and all the things that uh, kind of occupy our normal week in lockdown. But it's great to, uh, to, uh, f to, to have Chris uh, on board and great to have uh, his family and great that he can lead uh, youth. And I pray that your state youth camp is fantastic. We're going to collect our offering now. Now, we don't collect that in some sense. You know, what happens is that for many people, in fact, for most of the church, they give electronically by electronic uh, funds transfer, FT. Uh, and we're blessed in that. Uh, I'll send out to uh, the church just this week some great news in that we we made our budget this this month. And so people have given and they've given sacrificially and they've given from their heart. And I just pray that you are blessed in that. I know that for many people it is difficult times. And I know that for many people they sacrifice immensely to give to the work of the church. I pray that you are blessed knowing that the gospel is going out, knowing that uh, your your word is 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 going out, knowing that the resources that the church needs to do ministry, to do effective ministry, has been supplied by what you give. So it's great. If you are not somebody who gives uh, regularly and sacrificially, just go to theheights.org.au, uh, and you can see on the website uh, a, a, a link in which you can give, and you can either set up. Uh, a systematic giving in through EFT or you can set up uh, giving through your credit card if that's you would like to do that but wh whichever way you go I thank you for your generosity I thank you for your gifts and I just let's pray as we uh, commit what you've given uh, what you're planning to give uh, before God so let's pray Lord everything we give is yours really we're just stewards of what you have given to us so we give you thanks Lord for what we have we thank you, Lord, for really when we look at the, the rest of the world that uh, we have in abundance. And so I do pray, Lord, that you uh, would bless those who give. I pray, Lord, for those who are currently on, uh, on job keeper uh, payments from, uh, from the government uh, each time to the, the, the COVID uh, emergency funds. I just pray, Lord, that you would help each family meet their needs. You promised, Lord, that you would. And I just pray, Lord, that um, people trust in you. You are a faithful God. We have faith in a faithful God. And so we just pray for that. And I pray, Lord, that as we meet for counsel and as we uh, plan and vision, Lord, of what we're going to be doing out into the future, we know, Lord, that you provide for your people. And so we're able to do that. Help counsel in their wisdom and what they uh, put that money towards. And help us, Lord, uh, to think about how you would launch us out into ministry. And, uh, and I pray, Lord, that as we move on uh, into this year and into the next, Lord, we might see you work in incredible ways through the heights where people might come to know you for the first time, that people might know your love, people might uh, witness your love in action, and we know that happens through what, um, one for one part, through what's been given, but the majority of it, Lord, is through your spirit as you enable us and equip us uh, for works of service. So I pray for this in your name. Amen. If you've got a Bible or if you've got a device, let's uh, thank God for the devices uh, out there. So if you've got a Bible or, or a device that where you can look up the Bible on it, well then basically we're going to be uh, looking at John chapter 20 and a large chunk of that, starting at verse 19, going through the verse 31. So John chapter 20, verse 19, going through to 31. You're going to see that on your screen. 
on the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked in fear of the Jewish leaders Jesus came and stood among them and said peace be with you after he said this he showed his hands and his side to the disciples uh, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord again Jesus said peace be with you as the Father has sent me I'm sending you and with that he breathed on them and said receive the Holy Spirit if you forgive the sins of if you give forgive anyone's sins their sins are forgiven if you do not forgive them they are not forgiven now Thomas one of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came so the other disciples told him we have seen the Lord but he said to them unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side I will not believe a week later his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them though the doors were locked Jesus came and stood among them and said peace be with you then he said to Thomas put your fingers here see my hands reach out your hand and put your hand into my into my side stop doubting and believe Thomas said to him my Lord and my God then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me and uh, you have believed, blessed are those who have, have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. I pray that God blesses you in the reading of his word and I pray that God equips Chris as he speaks to us now and presents that passage and unpacks it for us to today. Hello church, I hope whether you're watching and listening to this live or you're watching and listening to this uh, at a later date that that this word, this sermon might be an encouragement and a, and a motivation to you in your own faith experience about Jesus. I think just as it is very easy to feel alone amongst the crowd, it's sometimes very easy uh, to be amongst a community or a family of believers, amongst other people who seem to have such an authentic, energetic and vibrant experience of faith and of who Jesus is, but to feel like you don't have that, to feel like, oh, where's mine? To feel like, why can't I seem to feel what they feel, to think what they think, to experience what they experience when it comes to having a relationship and a connection with our Lord Jesus. Our text today comes from the very end of John's Gospel. It comes from a, a section right at the very end where Jesus is recorded as appearing to his disciples minus Thomas and then a week later then appearing to Thomas. I think there's a lot here that might help us to uh, answer the question of how do we make the experience of Jesus and the experience of faith something that is our own. The title that I've placed at the top of this sermon today is Make Believe, Make Believe. Allow me to just pray for a moment, pray with me uh, wherever you're at. God, I, I ask you uh, in this moment and in whatever moment my words are being heard, that you and your spirit would generate in us such an enthusiasm, such a desire to to want to have our own experience and understanding of faith. Help us, Lord, to not drift away or to give up. And certainly, Lord, help us never to be a people who pretend or just fake it. Lord, we thank you for Jesus and we thank you for your word and we thank you that you still reach out to us today. You are our shepherd and we thank you that you lead us and you guide us. Amen.
I'm not sure about you whether you've ever had this experience of when somebody has recommended something to you but your initial instinct has been one of uh, sort of I don't know about that uh, I'm a bit skeptical about that or even I'm not doing that I'm not listening to that song I'm not watching that show you can say that that show is the funniest show you've ever watched a hundred times I'm not watching it in fact every time you mention it I want to watch it even less one thing that you might know about my wife Kate is that she loves true crime podcasts she loves listening to these podcasts that go into the details of crimes that have been committed uh, and then tries to understand what actually happens in them happened in them and, and, and then tries to solve them or understand what happened she loves listening to true crime podcasts on occasions when I walk into the room and she's listening to these podcasts and I happen to hear just like a small section of what she's listening to I'm often actually alarmed by the disturbing content that she's just casually listening to and almost relaxing to well a few years ago Kate would not stop recommending to me one of these true crime podcasts she came to me and said look I know they're not necessarily for you Chris but but there's one, there's this one that you might really enjoy. And she wouldn't stop recommending it to me. So you know what I did? I went ahead and didn't listen to it. I had no interest. I was skeptical of the recommendation. Well, about a year later, uh, I stumbled across this exact same podcast. And as I stumbled across, across it, I listened to the first little bit of it. And then I listened to all of it. I was hooked. I listened to every minute. I read every article about the podcast. I, I read every uh, Reddit post about the podcast. I went deep and deep and deep into it. And it's interesting because originally I was very skeptical that Kate was recommending it. But then when I had my own experience of it, when I had my own sort of feeling like, oh yeah, I get this and it's mine and, and, it, and it's something that I'm connecting with, I took ownership over the experience and then I went and recommended it to people whose eyes then glazed over and weren't interested. Are you naturally skeptical of recommendations too? I'm not sure. Someone ever said, hey, listen to this song and you thought, I'm not listening to that song. Well, in our story in John, Thomas is told something. He's told of an experience and his, his initial reaction is something that I'm hoping to unpack today and and one little strand of it I think is 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 a little sense of skepticism a little sense of mm, I'm not sure about that or maybe a little sense of that might be your experience but I'm going to wait until I have my own experience to feel like I'm going to connect with it you see the disciples came to him the rest of the gang everyone minus himself and another and uh and and said to him, Jesus is back. He's alive again. He's alive again and he appeared to us. He showed up. We saw him. We touched him. He was real. He was there and, and he left again. But we saw him. And Thomas says, uh, I'm not sure about that. He actually says, unless I see what you're talking about, I won't believe it. He says, I need to see those nail marks because I saw him dying and suffering on a cross. I saw the nails through his hands and through his feet. And unless I see those marks, you might be my friends, but I don't really want to put that much trust on what you're saying. I won't believe it. And one of the issues here, of course, is that Thomas wasn't there. Have you ever not been in the room for something cool that happened? Imagine a scenario where we're at youth group one Friday night and, and uh, one of our youth leaders just happens to not be there uh, and, and we have like the best night that's ever happened and, and all these crazy things happen, you know, famous people turn up, uh, we find treasure out in the car park, uh, you know, and, and maybe even something supernatural or just mind-blowing happens and then uh, that youth leader, let's say Alyssa, comes along next Friday and everyone's like, you weren't there, oh, this amazing thing happened. Alyssa's reaction might be like, mm, okay. But her reaction might also be like, oh, why wasn't I 
there. I can't believe I missed that one time. I can't believe out of all the times I missed, it was this one time that people were just, won't stop raving about. Thomas wasn't there when Jesus appeared. And we aren't told why. Whether he's off getting a haircut, or he had a dentist appointment, or he just didn't feel like being around people that day. He wasn't there. Everyone else was there, but Thomas wasn't there, and he missed out. For some of us, missing out is our greatest fear. We have FOMO, fear of missing out. And I want to say to you right now, if that's you, you hate missing out, you hate that idea that there's all this other awesome stuff going on and you don't get to experience it, this FOMO that can take over your life, I'll tell you right now that if you let it take hold, it will ruin you. It will hurt you. If you live your life with a feeling or a perception that other people are having more fun, living better lives, experiencing better things than you currently are, it'll give you a feeling of envy and it'll give you a feeling of being incomplete. And so what happens when we have FOMO, when we have a feeling that we are not complete and that everyone else is complete, we start chasing after every possible experience in the hope that if we experience that and that and that and that, if we're in every room when everything happens, if we are in every social media photo of every party, then then finally, then finally, I will be complete. And if we live our lives like that, we'll be chasing and chasing and chasing and chasing and it'll be like chasing after the wind, we'll never ever catch it. And I think one of the things that does sort of give us a sense of missing out or at least can exacerbate it, make it worse, is social media or more specifically scrolling through social media, looking at all of the awesome things that everyone else is getting up to, having an experience, you know, of, of the highlights of other people's lives, often while we're scrolling in a place that's not that exciting. Because if we're scrolling, we're not really doing anything. We're either home alone or we're on on the bus home or, um, you know, we just like need a bit of a dopamine hit. So we pick up our phone looking for something that'll make us feel better. And then we jump on Instagram or Facebook or whatever and we see all these cool things that other people are doing and it just makes us feel worse. A few years ago, I, I made the decision to stop posting my own highlights on social media. It's not something that I think everyone has to do, but for my own self, I decided to stop doing it. And the reason I stopped doing it is I, had a con- I was really convicted about what my motivations were for posting my highlights. And my motivations weren't pure. My motivations weren't, weren't good. And I was also convicted about the idea of, are these doing more good or bad for the people that are sitting there scrolling? seeing the highlights of my life, presented in a particularly curated way to make sure, to maximise the look of how much fun I'm having, how much joy I'm having, all, all these awesome experiences that I'm having. Look, and, and, and I was really convicted why I was doing that and, and the impact that that was having on people as they scrolled. And I don't think everyone else has to do that. I think other people's motivations are much purer than mine were. But I will say that ever since I stopped doing that, I've actually enjoyed the highlight moments of my life even more, knowing that they were mine and mine alone or they belonged just to me and the very few people around me. I almost, I almost enjoy now the idea that people don't know all of the highlight moments of my life. Missing out is something that will make us feel incomplete, envious and will make us chase after things. And there's another real and legitimate sense of missing out at the moment that I think people are dealing with. And I think that's the, those who, because of lockdown and COVID and all that stuff, uh, may feel like they're missing out on milestone moments in their life. I do feel particularly for those who were in year 12 last year and in year 12 this year. There are other milestones, but my heart particularly goes out um, to those in those particular brackets because your last year of school and then, and then for some, those that go to uni, that first year of uni can be like a 
you know, something that they, they've been looking forward to. They've been looking forward to having that experience and missing out on that can have a negative consequence on how you feel about yourself. You might feel like everyone else got to experience an uninterrupted year 12 and you've had this nightmare experience. Everybody else got to have the option of going to schoolies and going wherever they wanted to go to and, and yours was a little bit more restricted. That everyone else got to spend those moments physically in person with their friends at school and you get to just see them as little squares on Zoom occasionally. And you might, if you're in that boat, feel a little bit like Thomas in the sense that everyone else got to see Jesus, but you just have to hear about it. And look, I'm not saying that in this story Thomas was in denial or jealous or envious, but I do think that Thomas had a determination that he to have his own experience. He wanted to have his own experience. He didn't just want to hear about other people's experience. He wanted his own, his own moment with Jesus. And I think we all want that. We all want our own moment with Jesus. And we also want our own sort of journey and our own path to have those moments that everyone else gets to have. And we can look at the timing of people's lives, we can look at other people's journeys, we can look at the things that they seem to be achieving or the things that they get to have and we can compare it with our own journey. We can compare it with the moments that we are living day by day. I do think that when you finish high school for the first, I mean, maybe five to ten years, sometimes for the next 60 years, but especially in that initial period, there can be a real battle in your mind to not compare your story with other people's stories. There's a real battle in your mind to let go of that feeling of there being a cohort that becomes almost like a competition in a race. And when you start when other people start to begin their careers and earn money and start climbing the ladders in their field, when other people start um, to get engaged or to get married or even to have kids, if we don't have the things that other people have, we can start to feel like we're missing out and we can start to feel like, where's mine? When others are travelling all over the world, and the most exotic place that you feel like you've visited is Byron Bay. You can feel like you missed out. It's a battle in your mind. It's a battle in your mind that I think that we all have to fight with and win. Particularly in those first years after high school. But then, I think, for the rest of our lives. As Thomas sat there listening to all of his friends talk about Jesus appearing, I think he felt left out. And he says in verse 25, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and I put my hand to his side, I will not believe. And because of this, Thomas earns the nickname of the Doubting Thomas. Sort of a, a phrase that then lingered on even to our day today, that if you're a Doubting Thomas, you're an example of someone that doesn't believe, that is very sceptical, that even though something happened, you don't think it did. And like many, I think, perhaps I believe this idea of Thomas being known for being doubting Thomas is a little unfair. Not just because of how the story ends, but also I think because I respect his determination to have his own experience of Jesus. I respect his determination to say, no, Jesus, I, I want to see Jesus. I want to know Jesus. I don't want to just hear about other people knowing Jesus. I want to know Jesus. I walked with him for three years. I heard his words. I saw him die on a cross. I, I want to see him myself. And I think we all need to have that determination. Even today in a different context, I think we all need to have that determination that the experience of Jesus, even though today our experience of Jesus is different, I'll get to that in a moment, in our experience of Jesus, I think that we ought to have the determination to have our own connection, our own unique moment and understanding of who Jesus is. Sometimes we might hear other people pray and we might think, I don't feel that. 
I, I don't feel like I can talk to God like that. We might see other people in, in music and, and worship and, and, and there might be a real intimacy in their eyes and we might think, why, why can't I feel that? Why can't I have that? Why don't I have that? We might hear, listen to other people talking about the Bible and God's Word and the treasures and the riches and, and just the awesome things that are in God's Word and we might think, when I open up those pages, I just the words just bounce off me. That is just not my experience. How can Jesus, we might think, feel so real and close to them, yet for me, he feels so far away, so unattainable, so disconnected from my own experience. And I think when we feel like that, I think when we feel disconnected, when we, I think when we feel like everybody else has that moment with Jesus and we don't have our moment with Jesus, I think that we have three main options. Three options that I've seen people uh, do in their own lives when faced with this type of feeling. Three options that I think are presented before us and I think option number one is the option to pretend. The option to just go with the flow. Instead of carving out our own experience of Jesus, option one is about copying other people's experience of Jesus. Oh, if they're going to pray like that, maybe what I can do is just pray like they do. I'll just adopt their style. Uh, what I might do is, 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 you know, they talk about the Bible like that, so I'm just going to put some of those in my memory bank, and, and when I'm asked about the Bible, I'll just put them back out there again. I've seen people who have started to feel the pressure of everyone else is sort of singing with this, this intimacy with Jesus, perhaps, so what they do is, is they close their eyes and, and, and just try and just look like everyone else is looking like into it just um i'm connecting here and what you're not you're not actually connecting you're just you're just pretending you're just doing what they're doing because you don't want to be the one that is feeling left out so that's option number one we can pretend option number two is to leave option number two is to go well they have something i don't have it and that can start to form in us a, a feeling of i think this this isn't for me or a feeling of I think they're all pretending. A feeling of, I don't think, I'm not feeling what they're feeling, so therefore, my assumption then is that this is just, this is just hocus pocus. This is just group think. This is just, uh, you know, a bunch of people that need a crutch and that's not for me and we can start to go down other paths. We can go, well, it's, I'm out of here. I, if I'm not going to have that ownership over who Jesus is in my own life, well, I'm not going to pretend, so I'm going to go. Option number two is to leave. And option number three, and the one that I want to present before you today as the one that I, that I think that is the better one to pursue and chase in our own life, option number three is not to pretend, not to leave, but to carve out your own unique experience and connection and understanding of Jesus, to carve out your own moment with Jesus. In a different uh, gospel, in Mark, in chapter 8, it says that Jesus and his disciples went to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do the people say that I am? You see, a growing buzz had started to form around who Jesus was. There was an expectation that the prophet that Moses had promised might be coming along, that the Messiah might be coming along. It might be, it might be something else that the Old Testament had promised. That there's a buzz growing. Something is going on here and people started to talk about Jesus. And Jesus knew that people were talking about him. He knew that there were different opinions floating around about him, just as there are today. So he says to his disciples, his closest crew, the ones that maybe have an ear on the ground and, and know some of these things that are being said, who do people say that I am? What's the word? What's, the, what's going on out there? What, what's the opinion? And so the disciples start throwing all these ideas out there, things that they'd heard. Well, it says, verse 28 of Mark chapter 8, some people say that you're... John the Baptist. Other people say that you are Elijah. Elijah was meant to return, so we think maybe you're, you're Elijah. And still others think that you're, you're just another prophet or you're one of the prophets. And Jesus considers, you just get this sense, he's considering, okay, so that's what people are saying. And you, and you suspect that there were probably a lot more other opinions out there as well. And he says to the disciples, he, he goes, okay, so that's what people are saying. And he looks at them 
And he looks at them and says, so what about you? Who do you say that I am? You see, it's easy, I think, sometimes to say, well, other people believe. This is what other people think. Oh, some people think this and other people think this, you know. Uh, I love doing that. I, I love uh, sitting on the fence by presenting both options and then slowly just slipping away going, yeah, oh, they're both good options, you know. But Jesus doesn't give them this choice. He says, what about you? In your heart, you've been watching me, you've heard my words, you've seen my deeds. I'm asking you guys now, who do you say that I am? And Peter steps up to the plate where nobody else would and he says, Jesus, you are the Messiah. You are the one who has been promised. You are the Son of God. You are the, 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 not just a prophet, but you are the prophet. You are the, the one, the Messiah, the Christ, the King of Kings. You are, you are it. You are the Messiah. That's what we think. It was a real turning point for the disciples' journey. They no longer were about what other people think. It was about who do you say that I am. And I actually truly believe that in our own lives, we have to have an experience at some point where Jesus looks at us and says, okay, who do the other people say that I am? And I wonder what you would say. I think, I think you would be able to come up with lots of things. Well, some of my friends at school think that Jesus, you know, just didn't even exist. And, and oh, well, this other person, you know, he, he thinks that Jesus existed, but he was just like a good guy that said some good things. And, oh, well, you know, uh, you know I have this uncle that believes that, you know, that, that, that Jesus was this and that. And, oh, well, my parents believe in Jesus. So my, you know, the, my parents say that Jesus is, is the Messiah. But my parents think that he's our Lord and, and Saviour. And, and, you know, I come to church and Mark says this. And, you know, if, if, you're, if you're in youth group, you know, you might come to youth and go, well, well, Chris says that Jesus is this. And we might be able to list off all of those types of answers. But I think at some point in our life, Jesus then looks at you and says, not your parents, not your uncle, not that guy at work, not that girl at school, not Chris, not Mark, not any of your leaders. Jesus will look at us and, and, and say to us, who do you say that I am? Your own experience, shaped by others and then formed in community, but owned by you. Elsewhere, Jesus in the Sermon of Mount in Matthew 6, I love it, he says, he says, when you pray, when you go and talk to God, not if you pray, but when you pray, there's an assumption there, when you pray, go into your room and close the door and pray to your Father who is unseen. He says, when we pray, go into your bedroom, close the door and have a moment in a space that is your own experience, your own space. And I think that can mean our literal bedrooms, but I don't think... Uh, that's not the interpretation that's like a legalistic, well, it has to be a room. I think he's saying carve out a space and a time and a moment in your life once and then over and over that is between you and God, your own experience. And so what happens when we do that is we, make a, we have a connection with Jesus, we have a connection with our, with our God that nobody else knows about and that nobody else can influence directly in that particular moment. It's our own it's our own moment. I've known of people who really struggled to carve out that moment, to have their own experience. And one of the reasons they struggled is because they just tried to replicate and copy what worked for other people. People with different personalities, people with different styles, people with different parts, in, you know, different, uh, at different moments in their journey. And they just tried to replicate something. They tried to fit it onto their own and it just didn't fit. It didn't work. <laughs> I know of some people that uh, the most life-changing moment for them was when they lit a candle in their bedroom and, and for all of a sudden, they felt like, yeah, this is how I want to pray. It was just something simple, something, you know, that doesn't have any power in it of its own, but all of a sudden, it was theirs. They lit the candle and, and for all of a sudden, it was just them and Jesus. For other people, it might be, uh, I, needed, I needed to turn some music on gently in the background. I know for some other people, it was, well, everyone I know prays with music on, Oh, as soon as I turned it off, I was free. It was my own moment. And listen, I, I don't light a candle when I pray. That doesn't do anything for me. But whatever your version of a candle is, we shouldn't feel like that we can't do it. If it's just stylistic, if it's just an experiential type thing that works for us, 
I think Jesus says, go into your room and pray to your Father who is unseen and make it your own. Jesus wants to know us and he wants us to hear his voice. And I think hearing and knowing Jesus' voice is a crucial part of making that experience our own. And I think it was a crucial part of Thomas's moment as well. You see, Thomas sort of made a request or he made a, a demand, you know, unless I see those marks, unless I see the scars, I'm not believing. Jesus wasn't actually physically in the room when Thomas made that request. A whole week later, Jesus appears to all of the disciples, this time with Thomas, and the first thing he does is he says to Thomas, put your finger here, look at the scars, reach out your hand and put it to my side, stop doubting and believe. First thing I want to say is, a week, Jesus? Can you imagine having a whole week of everyone around you talking about this awesome experience with Jesus? A whole week of feeling like you missed out. A whole week of thinking that other people sort of must be superior and special and all of these things. A whole week Thomas had to wait. And then when Jesus does appear after a whole week, the first thing he does is he goes to Thomas and almost answers the prayer. The prayer that might have felt like, Jesus, how did you know? Well, we know how Jesus knew. He, he, is, he is Lord. He's King. He's God, the Son of God. And Jesus knows what Thomas needed and he, and he provides it for him. And something I want to highlight here is, is the part of this that, that just simply says, then he said to Thomas. Verse 27, then he said to Thomas. Because, and I don't want to reach here, but then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand, put it in my side, stop doubting and believe. And then verse 28, Thomas has a reaction. He says some things back to Jesus. And while I think it's possible that Thomas did actually have that moment of going, okay, let me reach out, yeah, let me suss out that scar, okay, let me... Maybe he did have that moment, but, but John doesn't record that. All John records is then Jesus said to Thomas, and then verse 28... Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. I think, honestly, all Thomas needed was Jesus' voice. All Thomas needed was Jesus looking at him and speaking directly to him. He needed his own experience of Jesus. And while I think he probably did eventually, you know, suss out the scars, I'd want to suss out the scars, I think that part of this moment was hearing Jesus' voice. And he says, my Lord and my God. Thomas doesn't just say, well, Jesus, you are Lord, you are God. It's personal, it's emotional, it's intimate and he takes ownership over it. It's no longer their God and their Lord, it's no longer, yeah, yeah, a Lord, a God, it's no longer somebody else's. It's so crucial to see Thomas gives us sort of a template and an understanding of what we might seek to ascertain in our own experience of Jesus. He says to Jesus, my Lord, my God. And so a lot of people argue, we need to stop calling Thomas doubting Thomas and call him confessing Thomas, because that's what he does here, confesses to Jesus and out in the public that Jesus is Lord and God and not just that, but it is his own. Mine, mine, mine. You are my Lord. You are my God. And Jesus says earlier in the Gospel of John in chapter 10, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And if we're to be Jesus' sheep and his followers, we are to hear his voice. And I think there's power in Jesus' voice in his words, in the way that he puts uh, sentences together. The, the voice is not just the tone and the audio, audible. We hear Jesus' voice now when we pick up the Bible and read what he had to say. We hear Jesus' voice now, I think, through the working of the Holy Spirit, illuminating that to us. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. And so we might then ask, well, well what, what about for us, because like, cool story, Chris, really cool. And, and we might think, well, if Jesus rocked up in, in my room physically and physically showed me his scars, well, I'd be all in. But that's not going to happen. That was, a, that was a unique experience just for the disciples. So what about us today? 
Well, in verse 29, and, and what I want you to see here is, this is how John ends his gospel. There's another chapter after this, after this that sort of acts as an epilogue, but this is how he ends his gospel. The last story that he tells is the story of Thomas, and the last thing that he records is Thomas's declaration, his confession. And, and almost anticipating the very question that you might be asking and anticipating the very question that I ask is the what about me question. In verse 29, straight after Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God, then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you believed. All right, Thomas, you got, you got what you wanted. You saw me. But Jesus then says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Besides the epilogue to come, that's the last words of the gospel in the last gospel of Jesus that we think was written. This is the last words recorded about Jesus, because you have seen me, you've believed, Thomas, and then turns to every other potential follower of Jesus, every other Christian in every age to come, including on the other side of the world, up in Hornsby Heights, in Sydney, Australia, 2,000 years later, he says, blessed are those, you and me, who have not seen Jesus in the way that Thomas got to, yet have believed. And then to sum it up, John says, look, I wrote my gospel with this in mind, not to like build Thomas up and Peter up and myself up, but so that people would have an experience of hearing Jesus' voice, that people would understand who Jesus is. And so we get to experience to Jesus today in many ways. One of the ways is through opening up the Bible and, 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 and even in particular in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, we get to see who Jesus is with the direct uh, purpose that we might then come to believe, that we might carve out our own moment of, of seeing who Jesus is and saying in our own time, in our own moment, my Lord and my God. And so John says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, which just think about that. We don't know what percentage of his miracles were recorded, but it wasn't 100%. They're just, they're just like getting down like what they remember, but this was happening all over the place, but they just got down some key ones that they thought really summarized who Jesus was. In verse 31, it, John says, but these are written, the examples that I've put together, the stories and the miracles and the words of Jesus, I've put these down in my gospel that you may believe. Who's the you here? Well, the you is the people who originally got John's gospel delivered to him, to them. He's saying, so that you may believe, but then it also applies to anyone that now reads John's gospel for all time to come. John's gospel and the story of Jesus was written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. And so you might be thinking, well, now what? what, what do, I just, do I just read John? Do I just spend some time in the Bible? And like, yes, <laughs> go for it, do it, of course, you know, that's why it was written. But I think that what I want to highlight today is just one strand out of many. I want to highlight today the idea that Thomas is given as an example for all time to come. For every Christian that's gone, I'm not feeling what everyone else is feeling. For every Christian that's ever thought to themselves, I'm not sure, I'm not sure he is my Lord and my God. I'm, you know, that's ever thought, you know, anyone that's been amongst a church community and looked around and thought, do I fit here? Do I believe what they believe? Do I experience what they experience? For every Christian like you and me that's ever had a moment of where's mine? Where's my moment? And I think Thomas in verse 28 when he says, my Lord and my God is sort of like put up there as something that we should be determined to chase after. We should be determined to find and 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 find in a way that's unique to us, to spend time in God's Word, to go and pray and seek God and say, God, show up to me, show up to me, to keep uh, putting God's Word uh, into practice in our lives, to see if the fruit will grow, and to keep saying to Jesus, I, I, I want you for myself. I want to look at you and say, I know who you are, and you know who I am. The tough thing is, not a magic trick, you're not going to be able to like, snap your fingers twice and turn around and then it happens but in your own way in your own space in your own journey surrounded by people who'll be positive influences on that 
My prayer for you is that you might have your own understanding and of experience of who Jesus is, not just other people's, but your own. Let's pray. Jesus, there's a lot of things that a lot of people say about who you are. Well, as a church, we say you're the Son of God. We say that you are our Lord and our Saviour. You say that you, we say that you are the one who is worth worshipping and worth knowing, the one who sits above all. And God, I just want to pray right now for those, particularly whether it's always been like that or they're just in a season of it at the moment of just feeling like, it's not, it's not landing with me. It's not connecting with me. I'm starting to have these other thoughts and, and the experience that other people are having is not helping. I pray for them. I pray that you show up for them through your words and through your spirit. I pray that you show up for them. And I pray that even more than that, you give them a determination, even in the seasons of dryness and even in the seasons uh, where it's not landing, to just keep putting that one foot in front of the other, to never lose the determination to know you as, as, as their personal Lord and their personal God. Help all of us, God, with this and help us never take for granted who you are and what you've done for us. And I pray that wherever people are listening and watching this service today, that there might just be a moment here or sometime today or sometime this week where they just have a moment with you. They just take a deep breath and, and, and remember all of your benefits and, and experience all of your benefits. You're so good to us, God. So generous and kind. And we thank you so much for it. We pray in that powerful name of Jesus. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you the lord turn his face towards you and give you peace the lord bless you face shine upon you and be gracious to you the lord turn his face towards you and give you peace favor be upon you in a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children be his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your coming, in your going, in your weeping, in rejoicing, He is for you, He is for you, He is for you.
Hey, what a great service, and, uh, and thank you, Quita and Mike, for blessing us and in, in music and song, and for Chris for a fantastic message. So I pray that you have a really blessed day, that you enjoy uh, this Sunday in, in all that offers, and that you get time to spend with your family, get out and, and, and walk around uh, the neighbourhood in a really COVID-safe kind of way, but get out there and walk ar around and do that exercise, and uh, more than anything, I pray that this day you might think more about how you're walking with Christ, how you're meeting with him and how you're connecting with him because he wants to connect with you and he wants to connect with me and he does that through his word and through his spirit in our heart as Chris reminded us today. So have a great day and a great week with our Lord. <laughs>